I forgot to mention that this evening's service is a modified Taze service. How many of you have done a Taze service before? A few of you. So you're doing very well with the music. Good for you. Um, this evening, as we continue our service, I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm reading from Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. As Jesus and his disciples were going out of Jericho, a large crowd followed him. When two blind men sitting along the road heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Show us mercy, Lord, son of David. Now the crowd scolded them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted even louder, Show us mercy, Lord, son of David. Jesus stopped in his tracks and called to them. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Lord, we want to see, they replied. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they were able to see him. And they followed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. to God. David wants me up here. Better? <laughs> so this evening we are observing Ash Wednesday. And it, Ash Wednesday, of course, is a day when we look back upon our lives and the things that we have done. And it's also a time when we can look ahead to the person that we should be and the person that we would like to become. It's a day when we acknowledge our sinfulness and we ask for God's mercy. We receive the ashes of repentance and we ask God to clean our hearts and to give us right spirits. But Ash Wednesday is also a beginning. It is a time when we begin the Lenten season, 40 days, a 40-day journey that leads to the cross. And this year, our Lenten journey will take us through the last week of Jesus' life, when we will hear the hosannas of Palm Sunday and experience the tension between Jesus and the religious authorities. We will watch as he shares a final meal with his closest friends and is betrayed for a handful of silver coins. We will experience the week that leads to his agony on the cross and that ends in victory with the empty tomb. So since we're on a journey, perhaps we ought to look at how Jesus started this journey that is the last week of his life. Well, that in itself is also a journey that takes Jesus to the same place, but by a different road, depending upon the gospel in which you are reading. But regardless of the road that Jesus took to reach his destination, his journey to Jerusalem was both insightful and transformative for those of us who study it. It helps us understand more about who he was and to help us know more about who we are as his followers and how we are intended to be. Now, I don't know how many of you know this about me, but I am a planner. Uh, I like to know ahead of time what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it. And some might even say that I am an overachiever when it comes to planning. And yes, they would probably be right. I can't say that I really like to plan things, but it, I do it because it's just the way that I am. For example, back in 2006, when our Girl Scout troop was taking a trip to Europe, there was no doubt in my mind that that trip would be planned down to the minute. We spent months with the troop uh, planning where we would go and how we would get there. Nothing was left to chance. We even planned our laundry days. 
because we were going to be gone for 17 days. And we even planned for the unexpected, like when our train was five hours late going from Paris to Rome, and when we stayed up all night celebrating with the Italians in Florence after their team beat France in the World Cup that year. Now, I bet some of you are planners as well, especially when it comes to your trips. You probably plan your itineraries, and when you get into your motorhomes, you have your GPS and your maps in hand. You even pack your suitcases based upon what you're going to do on the trip. No more, no less, just the clothes that you think you're going to need. But have you ever gone on a spontaneous journey? When you just threw a few pieces of clothing into a backpack or a suitcase and went on your way for a few days? Well, we used to do that quite frequently when we were living in Germany, David and I. Those kinds of trips, of course, don't take a whole lot of planning. But I would say that the amount of planning for a trip is determined by the purpose of the trip. Now, I remember after my father retired in the early 1990s, my parents decided to take a cross-country trip to visit relatives and friends. Now, the thing you need to know about my parents is that they didn't always get along with each other. In fact, they probably spent more time arguing than they did uh, just agreeing with each other. So when I heard that they were going to take a trip from California to Arizona to Texas to uh, Indiana, or excuse me, to South Carolina, then to Indiana, to Wisconsin, to Las Vegas, and then to the Grand Canyon and back to California together <laughs> in a car just the two of them, I said to myself, one of you is not coming back alive. <laughs> but the truth is, they both did come back alive. And in fact, it was one of the most enjoyable trips that they took in their later years. I think part of the reason why it was so enjoyable was because they took their time on the open road. They knew where they were going, and they knew kind of how they wanted to get there. Uh, they knew that when they were tired, they would just find a motel. They didn't make reservations. Uh, they just simply stayed wherever they happened to be. Uh, so the journey was planned, but it was also spontaneous. Because if they decided that they wanted to stay for a few days in one particular place, then they just did. It didn't really matter. And I think that that journey changed their lives and their relationship with one another because even though it might have been my imagination, I think my parents got along a lot better after that trip that they took together. And you know, in many ways, Jesus' journey to Jerusalem was a lot like my parents' cross-country trip. He knew where he was going but he took his time getting there. He had a plan, but was willing to deviate from that plan if it meant that lives could be transformed in the process. In Matthew's Gospel, which I read this evening, toward the middle of chapter 20, uh, Jesus tells his disciples that they are going on a trip. This is before the portion that I read to you just a while ago. Uh, he writes, look, we are going up to Jerusalem. The human one will be handed over to the chief priests and legal experts. They will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be ridiculed, tortured, and crucified. But he will be raised on the third day. Unfortunately, Matthew's gospel does not give us an itinerary of Jesus' trip, so we don't know how long or by which route Jesus and his disciples traveled. But we do know that once he made it to Jericho, he encountered the blind men who, have, who needed to have their sight restored. And Jesus had compassion upon them, touched their eyes, and gave them their sight. But if we turn to Luke's gospel, 
we discover more specifics about Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and the route that Luke believes that he took. Luke devotes nearly 10 chapters from chapter 9, verse 51, to 19, verses, verse 27, to Jesus' journey from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. That's more than one-third of the Gospel of Luke, which tells me that according to Luke, this was pretty important stuff. In Luke, we learn that Jesus' trek to Jerusalem took him through Samaria, located between Galilee in the north and Judea in the south. Now, most people in that day would have traveled from north to south by going uh, over to the other side of the Jordan, taking the King's Highway that ran parallel. It was the most efficient way to go, and it was also the safest because it kept them out of Samaria. Now, the Jews especially would have taken the King's Highway because it kept them out of Samaria. And we all know that the Samaritans were the enemies of the Jews. But Jesus, according to Luke, does not take the alternate route. He does not go by way of the king's highway. Instead, he goes straight through Samaria. He takes the, low, the road that is less traveled, the road that no upstanding Jew would have taken. It was a road that took him right into enemy territory, but Jesus knew that that was where he was supposed to go, even though in the passage that we heard read today, many of the Samaritans did not welcome him. He knew that the Samaritans needed to hear the good news, and he was willing to set aside their differences in order to deliver that good news to them. Jesus took the more dangerous road to show that God's grace was available to all, even those who were hated and avoided. Jesus refused to take the easier road, and by doing so, he shows us the path that we are supposed to take as well. Jesus challenges us to think about the Samaritans in our own lives, the people that we don't really want to be around. And by doing so, he challenges us to be with them, not just to think about them, and to love them, because he knows that when we do, both our lives and theirs will be transformed. Following Jesus requires us to take the more difficult roads in life, and to share God's love with everyone, even the Samaritans who are in our midst. Now, in Jesus' day, traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem would have taken about three days. But according to Luke's gospel, it took Jesus three months to do the trip because he took his time. He knew that he had work to do. He knew that there were a lot of people who needed to feel God's love and presence, that a lot of lives needed to be transformed. And Jesus also knew that he didn't have a lot of time in which to do it, because when he arrived in Jerusalem, he knew that he would be arrested and ultimately would be crucified. Jesus knew that when he left Galilee, and set his face toward Jerusalem, that he only had three more months in which to do his ministry. And so he may had to make the most of the time that he had left. I wonder, what would you do if you only had three months to live? Well, Eugene O'Kelly, who was chairman and CEO of one of the largest accounting firms in the United States, he owned a penthouse and a, a penthouse apartment in New York City and lakefront property where he and his family vacationed for more than a year. He had more money than he ever knew what he could, could even do with it. And according to his friends, he was living high on life. He was on top of the world. And then the unthinkable happened. 
Eugene developed terrible headaches and vision problems. At first, he dismissed them and said, oh, it's probably just overwork and stress, lack of sleep. But a battery of tests revealed the truth. He had multiple tumors in his brain, and they were inoperable tumors. His doctors told him he had three months to live, a death sentence with no chance for appeal. Now, not one to sit around and do absolutely nothing. Instead, Eugene developed a plan for his last three months of life. He made lists of the people that he wanted to see and the things that he wanted to do. But instead of rushing through that list, he proceeded through it slowly, savoring every moment. In the book that he wrote about his experience, he called them perfect moments. And some of his perfect moments were spent with family and friends. Others were spent in solitude, communing with nature and being alone. But to Eugene, every perfect moment was a gift a moment when time stood still and each experience could be taken with a sense of wonder. Four months after his diagnosis, Eugene O'Kelly died, just as the doctors had predicted. But his final moments were filled with what he called those perfect moments, which he said offered him great insight into the ultimate meaning of his life. I think that perhaps the last three months of Jesus' life were also filled with perfect moments, moments when, for the people involved, time absolutely stood still and their awareness of God was heightened, moments when their lives were made new because Jesus healed them and their broken bodies and restored their broken spirits. Moments when he drove out the demons in their lives and transformed them into the people who were no longer considered worthless. Moments when he turned their worlds upside down and restored their dignity by putting their needs first. During those three months on this, his journey to Jerusalem, Jesus changed the lives of many people To them, I think those were perfect moments when their lives were made absolutely new. So on Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, as told to us in the Gospel of Luke, we see how Jesus transformed many, many lives. But even though our upcoming sermon series is going to be focusing on the last week of Jesus' life as told in the Gospel of Matthew, I encourage you to read those sections of Luke, starting with chapter 9, verse 51, through 19, verse 27. Because when you do read that, I think you will see that Jesus' journey to Jerusalem was more than just a trip to the city. It was an important part of his ministry, during which he offered God's grace to everyone. His journey transformed many lives in first century Samaria, and his grace offered without price transforms our lives today. In the coming weeks, we will continue along Jesus' journey as he enters into Jerusalem on his way to the cross. This Sunday, we will experience his grand entry into Jerusalem And every week after that, we will learn more about the things that he did that ultimately led him to the cross. But even though the journey that was Jesus' life will end at the end of Lent, our journey today is just beginning. And the good news is that our journey does not require any elaborate travel plans. We won't need a GPS or a map we won't even need a suitcase. All we will need are our Bibles. And if you would like to take the uh, Lenten study, the handouts that are given uh, during that study. Because as we journey with Jesus through the last week of his mortal life, 
we will very likely experience our own transformations, just like the Samaritans and all of the others that Jesus encountered on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to the cross. May our Lenten journey together be filled and blessed with perfect moments that transform us through God's amazing grace. Amen.